Welcome to our program on community and micro hydroelectric power projects. I'm Elizabeth Golden Pigeon, the Education Program Coordinator. Our program is sponsored by the Acorn Renewable Energy Co-op and the Addison County Regional Planning Commission with additional funding from the Department of Energy. Tonight we're going to have two speakers. Our first speaker is Deborah Sachs. She is the Sustainability um, Director at Eco Strategies. And our second speaker is Fred Dunnington. You probably know Fred because he's our town planner. So we're going to begin with Deb. Thank you, Deb. Thank you. And um, thank you for having me. I feel privileged to be here in downtown, beautiful downtown Middlebury today, and uh, to talk about a project a little bit north of you in, in Barrie. Uh, Eco Strategies is a, a company that helps to drive green business, um, implement it. Um, I'm with uh, Fuss and O'Neill, uh, which is an engineering design build firm uh, with about 300 engineers and scientists uh, working to engineer projects. And uh, I'm not an engineer, I'm a planner, like Fred, and so I'm hoping that anybody in the audience that are experts, if we're there's an engineering question that you might be able to help out. But um, anyways, um, I, uh, I've been working in planning and climate change uh, mitigation for almost 20 years. Uh, my background is land use planning, and um, I've been pleased to be working in the area of climate change mitigation for some time and assisting communities, assisting nonprofits, and now more recently at taking projects that have been in the planning uh, to implementation. So we're hopeful to get these kinds of projects built and to move away from our dependence on fossil fuels. And I think there's huge opportunity uh, here in Vermont and beyond uh, for hydro. So with a, a for-profit, I also am associated with a non-profit. So that part of my job has really been about the mitigation, education outreach and public engagement um, to, to mitigate uh, climate change. And that's been a lot of fun. I've worked uh, with the city of Burlington. I've worked uh, with communities all over Vermont with, associated with, I don't know if many of you have heard about the Vermont Energy and Climate Action Network, VCAN. You hear down in downtown uh, Middlebury, and in Middlebury you have an active energy committee, and um, I'd invite you all to learn more about what they're doing, really good stuff. Um, so I'd like to begin, um, and my focus will be on the Barry Micro Hydro Project. I'll tell you where, how that came about, and we'll move into talking about Middlebury's story. So this is really uh, just really focused on one project and how we're going through this to get the city of Barrie um, to get their first hydro project. And let me tell you about this. So I'm assuming that everyone really knows what hydro is. Um, <laughs> no answers. Okay, we don't know what hydro is. <laughs> uh, micro hydro. Um, it's really, you know, recovering energy, and in, in the Barry City application, it is energy recovery. And um, there are different applications, low head and, or, or low flow uh, applications, and um, they could be open or closed. And, and Fred's going to give you a little bit more on, on things, so I'm going to kind of go over this uh, kind of quickly. Do we want uh, Elizabeth to wait for questions after I make the presentation, or uh, no? They can ask questions. At any okay, time. inviting you to in, for clarifying questions um, if you need, or uh, to just chime in, chime in. So some background: um, the city of Barrie uh, was fortunate in 2007 to uh, acquire a grant and initiated a, a look at the city as a whole and they discovered they've got five locations in the city where there were former hydro dams. And, um, and so they looked at each one of those in terms of the feasibility on a very uh, coarse level and decided in uh, 2008 to take one of those projects forward. And this is an in-pipe, in-line application. So it's a, a domestic water pipe coming down from the reservoir and the water treatment plant coming into the city at a pretty high pressure way. So they decided to choose this in-pipe application as a verse, versus an open 
uh, hydro. So this is going to be talking about that uh, project. So in 2008, they went to the Clean Energy Development Fund, and forgive me for these acronyms that I have up here, but Clean Energy Development Fund ha was created a number of years ago, and they actually secured, the city secured a $100,000 grant to, um, to advance the project. And they, they needed additional funding. Initial, the initial look was uh, um, about a $340,000 project to, to do this. Um, and, um, and they didn't have what they thought enough resources there yet. So the $100,000 seeded that, and uh, that's where uh, Fuss and O'Neill and Eco Strategies came in because I was standing in a room at National Life, and the planner came to me and said, Deb, do you know where we can get some money? And I go, for what? You know, <laughs> so he, you know, and so we started to talk about that. And um, now we're in 2012, and uh, we're finally off the ground. But so um, they they were seeking additional funding. Uh, we uh, entered into an agreement, Fuss and O'Neill and Eco Strategies, to do a pre-feasibility study because we weren't sure about the numbers, and we weren't sure that this project was in fact feasible. Um, and in 2000, we found that to be feasible, uh, the project to be feasible after doing some flow testing and, and whatnot, um, and now we're in final design permits and additional grant funding, and I'll talk about that. Well, the whole purpose for them was to generate power, and this is up at the, up, up at the falls and um, really up in, actually I think it's Barry Town, um, and, or maybe it's even you know, orange, I can't remember exactly where it is, but um, it enters into a treatment plant and comes down the hill in a, a water main. And um, this happens to be a view of the current vault, which is about 100 years old. Um, it's a high pressure coming into a low pressure, and you can't really see the whole workings here, but it's in pretty poor shape. And in fact, it's, uh, you can't see it from here, but access in and inside that vault um, is a little bit persnickety in terms of people feeling comfortable and safe in it, so they know that they needed to upgrade their vault. Um, so that is part of this project. Um, in the pre-feasibility side of this, we said, well, what are the flows? So we went back and, and uh, uh, checked what those flows are and the average number of gallons um, over the 24 hours ranges from you know, a low of 300 up to 700. And um, so we got a sense of the gallons per minute coming through that, um, that uh, pipe and, um, and also looked at the driving head. Um, and uh, got, an, got that an assessment and did, ran the numbers, looked at what the costs were going to be, and um, presented. In fact, this presentation was given to the city council uh, in these results. Um, here we've got the million gallons per day ranging at around uh, or hovering around uh, one, and, one and a half million. Um, and over the 12 month period, we're not quite sure what the anomalies are here, um, but it's probably something going on, but can't totally explain it. But generally speaking, we're in this, this neighborhood. So this is the site location. This is where Nelson Street meets Hill Street, or Hill Street's on, the, on this part of the, here, and, and Nelson is here. And this is the current, we're standing actually, next to the vault. That's the vault. It's got a couple of uh, doors that flip up and that's the let where you saw the ladder before going down, looking down into it. Um, we've got a, a, a unit, electrical unit here, uh, a pole. So we've got uh, power close by. Um, but we've also got, this is two vacant lots right here owned by, and you'll see in a minute on the site plan, owned by the owner across the street here who owns a, a two-family. So he owns a two lots. This is sort of a, a ledge wall and um, some nice ledge outcrop right here. <laughs> so we're kind of going, hmm, um, how much do we need? How much room do we need? Um, so we're right now, uh, did some just just barely did some core samples in in this vicinity because the city's hoping that it can keep it within the right of way without uh, impacting the adjoining lot. 
of course this will be below grade so even if it were adjoining or into the lot um, it, the, it would still be a buildable lot. So here's the current site conditions where the water main comes down the hill and then a pressure reducing valve uh, it takes a high pressure of about 160 PSI <coughs> to um, uh, 50 PSI. Um, so we're, we're trying to get the pressure down so that we can serve the downtown um, city of Barrie. And there's about 10,000 um, uh, customers on that, on that system. This is um, where we proposed initially and presented to the city uh, the new vault location um, from the existing. And we would, once this is all in place and we've repiped, um, we would abandon this site um, or this site. It would be a backup while we're in construction, which um, is a little nervous about this. If anybody, anybody here work with pipes <laughs> and stuff. Um, it's, you know, it's a hill and it's, uh, you know, not as straightforward as it looks. Um, but anyway, so we've got the proposed there. Well, after looking at this a little bit more, um, and uh, you can't really see these, so I'm just um, not very good site plans here to see, but it looks as though we're going to go push, push this uphill for um, drainage purposes within the vault um, and will allow us to put a more elongated system in uh, what I'd call a dance floor so we can get the turbine in there uh, along with the, um, the other kinds of things that are necessary to be in there. That's a very technical finding. <laughs> um, so the new PRV, we haven't selected a turbine yet. That's happening as a separate process. Um, the bid pr package has just uh, been developed, or I mean, sorry, the, the RFP in, uh, has been developed, and a number of uh, turbine makers have been contacted to um, go back and forth in terms of what we think might and could happen for this. Um, I didn't say, we're looking at about 20 kW, so the system's not very big, but it's, you know, <clears throat> enough to generate enough power for um, what we think in the range at today's rates um, would be about 25,000 a year. So it's a small system, but it's not doing anything right now, so it's, <coughs> it would be group net metered. So as part of the pre-feasibility, and again, the numbers are not very clear on here, I'll just... I'll, I'll just say that it got kind of complicated, you know, because of grant funding and whatnot, and I'll, I'll get into that in a minute. We decided to separate out just the water system, the vault side of it, and what that meant for um, improvements and estimation, estimated costs. And that's hovering around 260000 We've upgraded that to 2012. Construction costs have gone up a bit, and... Um, for piping and whatnot, so it's it's not too far off that mark. But then we looked at a couple of turbines at um, um, of different efficiencies, 50% um, ADF um, at 0.7 million gallons per day um, is alternative A, and that would have about a 13-year payback when you enter in all of the construction, uh, the grant funding, so the net project cost. Mm -hmm. Um, for the energy side of that, for the lower cost uh, turbine, um, would be about, um, which would only produce about 15 kW uh, at about 160,000. Whereas alternative B would be more of a 20, uh, 24 hour per day uh, utilization, or I don't, how would I say that? I'm again, not the engineer here, so. Um, it's a 24-hour per day, more efficient turbine, and that's got a more favorable payback of about eight years. And that's just, the eight years is just on the energy side of this. So the vault, you know, really is um, a deferred maintenance and a requirement anyways of the city, so that kind of helps, helps us to understand um, what the hydropower costs are. So in looking at turbines, we, we have been, um, there's not a lot of this, you know, this is new, this is uh, very new. And 
we're finding that, you know, that the turbine makers want to come up and drop the turbine off, you know. <laughs> And we're kind of feeling nervous about that. Um, so there's some discussion underway, and we'll be looking at an evaluation, uh, requiring an evaluative um, uh, you know, proposal. Uh, this happens to be a turbine um, in North Vancouver, um, a PRV pressure reducing valve. Um, uh, and this happens to be another application by Canyon Hydro in Bennington. Um, and Bennington, this is up at the water treatment plant, and it looks like it's huge here, and, and um, here's the control panel, and you know, they've got their normal operations for uh, water um, you know, processing and whatnot, uh, but this is the actual unit for the hydro, um, and it comes in and gets processed turbine and, and goes on and through, and that one is about a 15 kW power um, producer, believe it or not. So that's in operation in, a can in, in Bennington, Vermont. A displacement turbine type, um, and again, chime in if, if anybody knows more about this than I do, but um, uh, this is another, dis it's another type, it's uh, displacing, is anybody here that knows and familiar? Are you? That yeah. Not, not, you're not, okay. Um, generator, turbine, um, you can see the, the various pieces here. I'm you know, not going to get into this because I'm not really qualified to do this as a planner and um, would invite you to uh, contact my, um, my engineer um, to talk more about this if you'd like to know more. But we're really, really early in the, in the stage of things and, um, and so we still don't know what turbine will be chosen for the city. Um, and this just talks a little bit more about um, uh, volumetric <coughs> displacement turbines, um, combining pressure control and harvesting the energy from the inte uh, intended pressure drop as, as electricity. Again, energy recovery. This is a vertical turbine model as, as opposed to a horizontal. This is uh, by Rentricity. This has actually been uh, uh, the choice in Keene, New Hampshire. Um, and uh, there's a few more proposals of Rentricity's uh, vertical turbine um, in, in uh, the U.S. Rentricity actually did a quite a nice job in terms of making a community video of the, the Keene project and got a lot of um, uh, community uh, engagement uh, through that process, and um, they're going. They're planning to put a, a proposal in, I think, on the Barry project. Um, so there's our company is also looking at wastewater and to, just a couple minutes on this um, wastewater applications. I think are also. I mean, in, when we look at the demand for energy in communities. Um, wastewater and water are big hogs, um, no two ways about it in terms of energy demand. Um, uh, community in uh, Vermont, I did some benchmarking for uh, both buildings and facilities and it represented 71% of the total electricity use for just wastewater. And um, so they're huge energy demand uh, operations. So. Um, I've got, I've got contact information. There's a handout um, that I put together inside your packet. Um, I didn't really talk too much about the, um, the process, the FERC process. Um, we're just beginning that process. Um, what happened was um, just, let me see here, whoops. Um, Uh, what I can say is, is that uh, the, where we are in the process is developing these permit applications for the city. Um, we've been in, in, we've engaged the uh, Agency of Natural Resources as one of the first steps. Um, the, the community wanted to look at securing its funding. 
And so we went to um, around and asked uh, USDA, uh, the Agency of Natural Resources, the community actually, uh, the city of Barrie is on uh, the drinking water list for a number of projects and we added the Nelson Street, this Nelson Street project to the list. They were declined um, initially because it wasn't a leaky enough pipe um, to be included in the green reserve fund or to be even considered categorically green. This wasn't considered categorically green so we went in <laughs> Last year, or two years ago, it didn't make it. Last year, it didn't make it. And we worked with the state and the Agency of Natural Resources, and we're going, this has got to be categorically green. <laughs> I mean, it's an energy project that's generating uh, energy. And finally, it, it, it made it to the list. And they are going to get, um, they have now been made eligible um, for a full uh, Green Reserve grant loan. And if they make the mark after we get it all together, um, it'll be their the community of Barry is a minus three um, community, which means that if they're awarded a loan, it's a loan grant, and 46% of that project over the life of the loan will be forgiven. So it's a 46% grant. So in addition to the 100%, in addition to this, their payback is actually even better um, than, and so the jury's out as to the exact payback until the turbine is, is selected, but um, have I used up my time? You're okay. I'm okay. Yeah. Question. Um, yes. Deb, uh, you said that you were looking at a 24-hour configuration or a must, must run, I guess you would call it. Yeah. Well, the, I guess that it's a, is your question around, um, I'm going to go back to that. Um, this table, which you can't see. Um, this is the Zeropex uh, model. This is the Rentricity model. Um, both gave us, so um, this Zeropex is a uh, European model. And so they would like to, you know, be in on the proposals and to try to get their turbine in. My, my question is around the uh, operating for 24 hours. You have a flow through the, at the capacity of the turbine for 24 hours. And it's coming out at an outlet of 60 pounds PSI. What do you do with that water at night when you're not, people aren't using it? I can't answer that question. <laughs> um, so your, your curve on 24 hours showed there was flow even. There is flow, yeah, thank you. Gary? Your first name, Gary? Um, let's go back to that. Um, so on this, on this curve, it shows oops. One, more, <coughs> one more back. It showed flow 24 hours a day. It's a little higher during the day. Yeah. So even at 3 and 4, 5 a.m., it still has 300 gallons a minute flowing. Okay. Apparently, there is a, the, and I don't know the technology well enough to be able to answer your question. And um, maybe offline we can, I, my engineer I wanted here tonight, but he's in Connecticut. <laughs> and so um, he would be able to answer that question. Is this uh, uh, network connected? Yes, this will be group net meter. Um, and so the, uh, we'll uh, take the, uh, create the, oops, flew right by it. We're planning at, you know, we're putting there is a, uh, a box that you can't really see right in this neighborhood that's uh, right now um, tracking uh, flows and whatnot in terms of, um, well, it's, it's a number of things. We're wanting to boost that up and actually um, put that, house that within the vault. Um, so again, the landowner over here would like things cleaned up in this neighborhood. So we've got the power pole here. We'll, uh, we'll uh, apply for after the FERC permit. We'll apply for a certificate of public good 
and group net meter it, and the word is is that uh, they'll, the city will be um, credited at 13 cents a kilowatt hour, or the going retail rate. So a point I was going to make is, <clears throat> excuse me, like a solar panel, it, it makes electricity however it has potential to do. Right. And the network takes care of that. That's right. And presumably, if it's a, not a positive displacement uh, turbine, then right. you still have to have a pressure regulator. Right. If it were a positive displacement turbine, then you adjust the load on the turbine so that you always get the proper pressure out. Oh, okay. Thank you. At least I would expect that's the arrangement. That sounds like it makes sense. <laughs> I don't know whether it is. So or you not. save the cost of a pressure regulating valve. Right. Except that whenever you take the turbine offline, you'd still have to have one. So. Right. <clears throat> There's got to be backup system measures. And, uh, you know, I've been handling the grant and the permit application side of things and not the engineering side of it. And so I'm at a disadvantage on talking about the engineering side of it. Question here to the right. Could you hand the mic over? Um, well, I'll speak now. Do you have a, no, that doesn't work. <laughs> that doesn't work. You well, have to speak. All right, here we go. You have to speak for the camera. Whatever works. Um, with respect to the permitting process, how many years do you anticipate that's going to take? Um, with a complete application, I mean, you know, the FERC, the FERC process uh, is estimated to be six months um, for this application. Um, that's the best case scenario if it's a complete application and if we've got all our exam you know all our letters from everyone in the world and that we've met the criteria uh, and the certificate of public good is a 30-day process and Green Mountain Power then follows that in terms of their review so it start it begins with getting our ducks in order getting we actually have to have the turbine decided the the contractor, all, all of that's got to be all done before we go for a FERC application. So that FERC, that's why we've got to get this, this RFP out, get the turbine selected, get the turbine identified, and then who's going to put it in place as part of the FERC application for exemption. Okay. It's an in-pipe. There is no impact on anything here, um, you know. And we're going to, the vault is going to, you know, I'm, looking at the vault as a separate thing uh, from the actual energy side of the project, which is FERC related. Any other questions for Deb? Thank you. Thank you very much, Deb. You're welcome. And now we're going to hear from Fred Dunnington about the Middlebury project. Okay, can you hear me? Uh, so I'm Fred Dunnington, I'm a town planner in Middlebury, and uh, I happened to come to town in 1981. It seems like a long time ago, but at the time I came, there was a big hydro project uh, that was deeply controversial in the town, uh, ongoing. And I came right into the, the, uh, the throes of that. So I, I had an early um, and very interesting uh, indoctrination into hydro uh, from the point of view of the town of Middlebury. Uh, let me just start by asking, uh, how many people here uh, were around in uh, the 1980s and remember that hydro project? A few of you, OK. And so for the benefit, I don't want to bore the people who have been through, suffered through this or lived through it, but there are people at home who may not have heard about it, so there'll be a little history. Uh, I was asked to speak uh, about, about the history of hydro in Middlebury, uh, some about the, the uh, regulations that uh, uh, all hydro projects face and the current status of the Middlebury project. You say, you know, our project. Uh, I have to say, this is the, the Holmes family project, uh, uh, and, and they are represented here, so uh, they'll, they'll correct me, I'm sure, and, and uh, or I hope. And, and then uh, a bit about microhydro. Middlebury has investigated this a bit, so, um, so that's what I intend to cover. Um, 
the history first. Uh, this picture is in the Sheldon Museum and shows uh, before the Battelle Bridge in the late 1800s, uh, you know, the sluice came through from, from part of the uh, river up here and a lot of mills connected to it. And the uh, 1900 uh, fire insurance Sanborn maps of the town, here's Main Street, here's the falls here, and the flume that went under, under the present Rogers block that the Holm family owns uh, came out here and was connected through these sluice ways, you know, uh, in serial connection to a bunch of mills. And this is why this is called Mill Street, not surprisingly. There were also a couple of mill sites on this side uh, of the river, uh, Gamaliel Painter's mill site, and then there was uh, the one that uh, later powered the marble works. And these were uh, early in their years, of course, mechanical water power, and only in the uh, end of the 1800s, early 1900s, did uh, they get converted to electricity, and uh, companies started to acquire the, the rights to these projects, and the predecessors of Central Vermont Public Service Corporation, Hortonia Power Company, and so forth, uh, and Middlebury in its time uh, at the turn of the century, that's the turn of the last century, uh, had a, uh, the Middlebury Electric Company to, uh, was formed for electric lights in town. So the history in, in, in Middlebury, uh, obviously there's several sites on, on Otter Creek at the falls that I just pointed out. The pulp mill falls down, downstream or by the pulp mill bridge, there's a major site there. The Middlebury River in East Middlebury, there are multiple sites there uh, near the Sand Hill Bridge and uh, near uh, Brown Novelty and Goodrow Lumber today were smaller mill sites. Um, and the Muddy Branch uh, over by Munger Street, there's a, the remnants of some, somebody trying to use some water power there earlier in history. Um, there is only today one currently operating uh, hydro plant. That's the Middlebury Lower Plant, so-called, uh, at the Pulp Mill Bridge. Um, the CVPS had operated uh, the site at the Middlebury Falls um, from the 19, early 1900s to the uh, 60s, thereabouts, uh, when that turbine fell into disrepair. And that, uh, you can see the remnants of some of that today. We'll show some pictures of that. But that had a big power, a big penstock, a big pipe, and a powerhouse attached to the stone mill in the bottom of Frog Hollow. And uh, that was abandoned at that point since... Uh, you know, with the advent of new, new sources of electricity that were touted as too cheap to meter and so forth. <clears throat> anyway, CV abandoned it uh, at that point. Uh, and uh, the town came to acquire the stone mill at the foot of Frog Hollow. And we sold it to a developer on the condition that it be renovated. And the town acquired, at that point, the mill rights or water rights that went with it. And um, the town earlier in history had used the the uh, mechanical power of the water for its first water system. So where the craft center building is on uh, Frog Hollow Craft Center, now Edgewater Gallery, where the kiln is, in that lower brick part, was the town's water pump. That was run by the tail race of, through the flume and me mechanically pumped water up to our reservoir. And that was the town's first water supply and firefighting system. And the town still uh, retains the water rights with that. And the town actually paid dearly for those early in its history. Um, more on that later. Anyway, since, since 1970, there have been, uh, there was a pump storage project. This is a kind of hydro project that uh, exists in some places, and it, it sounds like uh, it uh, uh, would be, doesn't, doesn't sound intuitively like it would work, but apparently it does. And this was involved Abbey Pond up in the National Forest, you know, off up in Ripton, and there's a huge area up there known as Beaver Meadows, for those of you who know it, and then down on the plains, so to speak, in the East Munger Street area, there's, uh, uh, there was a proposal to make quite a large impoundment. This would have been a very shallow, very large lake. And the idea was that, you know, that water would flow down and uh, they'd turn a turbine and fill up this lower lake and then at night they would pump it back up again and it would come back down. You would think the energy of pumping it back up wouldn't be worth uh, what you get from it, but uh, this was uh, considered in the early 70s, I'm told, and uh, I haven't seen very much information about it, but uh, needless to say, it raised a lot of environmental issues for people in that neighborhood. Uh, when I came to town in the 1980s, the town was in the throes of, of this. Uh, the CVPS was considering reestablishment of its project on the falls, and at that time, 
The town uh, voted uh, in favor of this, and they worked out an agreement with CVPS. The town went through an environmental mediation process for this. This is one of the early uh, instances of environmental mediation, and that was a very interesting experience for me as a planner to be involved with. Um, and uh, they went through the FERC process. But after all of that, they abandoned it for economic reasons. It just didn't pencil out in terms of the uh, expense involved for what they could sell the power for. But since they had gone through all of this effort with the FERC permit, and there's a huge amount involved in that, that was worth a lot. And two other suitors came along following that, one a firm called Hydroelectric Development Inc. of Denver. Uh, the select board at that point said, hey, if our town utility can't see it's cost effective, why do we want to sell the, have the, some out-of-state you know, investors try to do something on our falls? Uh, won't that be equally cost ineffective? Uh, so they voted against it at the time, and then uh, subsequently, uh, Middlebury Falls Hydropower Inc., which was a subsidiary of Environmental Power Corp., uh, chief person involved with that was John Spencer, a person who's well known to hydro folks in Vermont. Uh, he now works with the SPEED program, a sustainably priced energy program. Uh, uh, he tried to revive and use this permit. Uh, at and there was a town meeting discussion of this in 1987. The select board subsequently also voted unanimously, saying that the, just the town was not interested. Um, there's a bit more history about this. I'll show some slides and breeze through that. But since there was a period of time where things were idle there, uh, since 2006, uh, the Holm family uh, has revived interest in a, a much uh, more modestly scaled, environmentally appropriate site using the existing flume, and I'll show you why it's different. And known as Middlebury Upper, since we had Middlebury Lower, there had to be an upper. And uh, this, uh, they also, there's an Upper East project, which is a related application having to do with the other side of the river that uh, I'll explain. So that's the, the brief history. This is Middlebury Lower. Here's the Pulp Mill Bridge. Otter Creek flows downstream. The falls are here, and there's a long canal in here, sluice gates in here. Trash racks in here, there's the powerhouse, which was built in the 20s, and this flows downstream. This is a relatively new air photo off Bing, uh, and this is their new substation, which they just built down there. The pulp mill, incidentally, this was uh, a, a mill site earlier in history. You can see Vermont Railway. You can perhaps detect uh, an old rail spur that went over, and there was a earlier mill sites in that area. One of the in best research studies of the history of water power that I have ever seen uh, uh, was brought to my attention. Uh, uh, this is a student at Middlebury College in the, in the 90s wrote uh, an historical paper, which is fascinating. And I would be happy to, this is great reading. Uh, you, if you think current regulations are oppressive in zoning, in the early history of the town, if you owned a mill site, you were required to develop it, or it was expropriated from you, because they were so valuable. Uh, the farmers agreed to tax themselves upstream, you know, it's very flat, long, long ways upstream, uh, calling this the mud tax. They went to the legislature, got approval to tax themselves in order to finance a mill site that was their means of grinding their grain. And so th there was, this was an economic development uh, machine for the town, and it's the reason the town, which originally was going to be out in Foot Street in its center, developed around the mill site here. And there was a huge amount of attention paid to early mill sites. And the history of this, and the mud tax, and the water rights, and the town uh, investing and paying a dear price for the low flow, the very first water for its firefighting and water system, that was the most important water to the town. Uh, so that's the genesis of why the town owns these water or mill rights, uh, now uh, perhaps archaic, but uh, for um, its firefighting and water supply. Um, anyway, great paper. And you remember that first picture I showed of the historical, well, there, subsequently Doug Lazarus did a wonderful painting of this, uh, uh, and this is a more modern romanticized view of what his, the history of Middlebury was like. Notice this, in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the eddy area, you know, uh, imagine some, you know, if anybody who really knows the eddy below the falls, okay, here's an aerial, here's the 
Main Street, here's the falls, here's the eddy, and here's the debris pile. <laughs> and when there isn't a debris pile there, there's this circular you know, kind of toilet bowl effect. And uh, things from farms upstream occasionally, you know, go around in there. And I get calls to the office. There's a dead cow. Can you, you know, can you get somebody to take that out of there? We've had that in 30 years. Anyway, uh, and, the, and this debris pile occasionally moves around. This is the most recent air photo. It seems to be piled up against the bank. But here's a picture where the debris has moved over here uh, from 2000. And I'll just stop for a second and, and illustrate. So here's the Battelle Bridge, and the river flows downstream. And you see the river is only this wide here. And well, this goes underneath the Holmes building. This is the flume. And you can see at this particular time in 2000, the sluice gates that CVPS abandoned had rotted out. And there was quite a bit of water running through the park here. This is the stone mill. This is so the power they used to have a penstock here. And it was a powerhouse here. And it discharged the down there. There were two other mill sites here, which uh, you can see the remnants of. There's a big hole back in here that, for those of you who've hiked back in behind the National Bank and poked around, uh, there is a hole drilled under the falls, the discharge of this, uh, uh, that was the outlet for that mill site. And then the remnants of this mill site, which used to be a seven-story building. Remember in that picture I showed you back here? This this is the bottom. What's left is the remnants of that. But this used to go to Main Street, and this was a mill, and all of the water power and machinery was vertically oriented towards that. All that went away in the Great Fire at the turn of the century. Uh, anyway, the, uh, so all of the mill sites have sort of been consolidated. The Star Mill, which was one of those mill sites with a flume running over to it, and the Tupper Mill down here, they're all gone. And they, what is left is this, uh, this mill site. And the town, as I say, acquired this. After CVPS uh, abandoned its uh, project in the 80s, the town came to acquire this piece of land here uh, that includes this natural area and the ledge at the base of the falls, uh, which was known as the Jessica Swift Park. And in 1980, CVPS had proposed, and this is an early photo simulation, so you're on the other side of the river looking over at the Frog Hollow Craft Center. This is the Holmes building. This is, they proposed to build a new wall out here and basically scoop up Otter Creek in large part. Here's a powerhouse. In this early photo simulation, they couldn't make the trees go away, but they would have gone away. This, so the entire natural area, the ledge at the base of the falls would have been wiped out. And there was, as much as the town was supportive of uh, alternative energy and hydro in the early 80s, um, this was really a tough question for the town. They agonized over this because this was a serious aesthetic impact and uh, the town was quite divided on it. So this is a political ad that CV stockholders paid for, you know, and uh, uh, what the issue was, would there be enough minimum flow of water flowing over the falls to maintain the aesthetic? So this is four inches of water flowing over the falls at Center Rutland. This was negotiated and I have to tell you, there's a great story about this. In this environmental mediation session, uh, late at night, I think it was after 1 a.m., we were uh, at, in the Middlebury Inn, and um, how to arrive at the um, amount of water that should be required to be spilled before CV would start to generate power. And so with uh, the kind of assumptions that you make at 1 a.m. when you're tired and uh, 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 a new planner to town uh, computed, said, well, let's say the water's flowing over the falls at you know, one foot per second, and let's say there's this many feet of falls, and there's this many cubic feet of flow per second in the river, so oh, 4.2 inches. Yep, that's it. So the mediation agreement came about totally arbitrarily, but it turns out that 4.2 inches happened to equate with a uh, certain minimum flow that is used in hydro projects called the 7Q10 flow, which is this, a statistical average of the seven days of lowest flow in a year, uh, averaged over a lot of years. And that's a, that, is a, that is nearly a drought condition, I'm going to say, say to people. And, and these days, a &R and fisheries folks uh, would prefer an aquatic base flow or something that's the minimum monthly flow, which is a whole lot more water or a whole lot less kilowatt hours if you're a hydro developer. And anyway. Uh, the amount of water required to be spilled was important. Here's another visual of this. You can see the trees gone. 
And uh, the town said, well, we really want to park there one way or the other. And, it, um, and another great uh, story related to this, the, uh, earlier in history, the, when the town had abandoned the hydro, the town was looking for downtown parking, which just goes to show you that things, some things never change in 30 years of planning. They still are. Uh, and, uh, you know, the town manager at the time, Dave Crawford, was uh, at a cocktail party with then uh, the uh, president of CVPS, uh, Jim Griffin, and, uh, wow. Well, so we're looking for parking down here. That wasteland that you're not using anymore below the craft center, and there's a little piece of it that comes up on Mill Street. Could we acquire that for parking? $1,000? Sure, send me something in the morning. So he went back. This is to confirm your offer to sell to the town of Middlebury. For, and this was held up later to be a valid purchase and sales contract, which the town exercised because it wanted to own the property and have control over this so that we would be participants in a hydro development rather than be subjected to it through FERC. So the town for many years ago got itself into wanting to have a say in, in a hydro project rather than be subjected to it. And the town drove it. So this was, this was the property plan. Here's the craft center. Here's Mill Street. Here's the alibi, the, now the star mill. Here is the stone mill. So the town acquired this piece of real estate here. And this was the shaded part was what was going to be leased to CVPS for a period of years. Uh, the town uh, would convey the water rights that were pertinent to the old powerhouse, were pertinent to its pump house, uh, and uh, this was the new powerhouse, and the ledge at the falls was gone, and they were building a road in around here, and um, that was the, the proposal at the time. And uh, it, was, it was hard negotiated. The town, you know, uh, it was a, a tough issue. Oops, I'm going the wrong way. So there was a lot of controversy. There was a group, Save the Falls. We wanted conditions to this. We voted to purchase the property to have a say. And they wanted to have a park, hydro or no hydro. And so this property was acquired, and it became known as the Jessica Swift Park. Even though it's a natural area and it doesn't have a sign or anything, it is a park. Still, the opponents of this uh, lampooned this idea that there could possibly be something aesthetically attractive down there and a hydro project at the same time. So this is a political cartoon from the Valley Voice, which was then a better paper and had good political cartoons at the time. And, uh, <laughs> and it depicts you know, the falls being dried up and garbage and so forth. Well, today, uh, the remnants of the Penstock support uh, are here. And uh, this is the back of the craft center. This right here is the, is the uh, town's old pump house. Uh, so there was a 10-foot pipe that came across so that you wouldn't be able to walk across the pedestrian bridge today. You'd walk into a pipe. Uh, I have other pictures of that somewhere. But um, anyway, this uh, CVPS at the time, interestingly, had a picture of this, this natural area with the ferns and everything. And uh, on its annual report, at the very time this was going through, and uh, at its annual meeting, someone said, that's such, such a beautiful area. Why don't you make that a natural area? And, it, and they had to say at the annual meeting, well, we're actually proposing a hydro project there. We're going to destroy it. <clears throat> uh, anyway, this is the sluice gate that CVPS abandoned. This is the Holmes building here. The sluice gate rotted out, and the water flowed through and has eroded the, the park uh, somewhat. Uh, so our early involvement with the Holmes family, when they expressed interest, was in trying to reestablish this. And the town at one point offered to, to pay uh, to, to do this. And, uh, Holmes decided they wanted to do it uh, uh, on their own. They needed to do other work on their building. So anyway, that's where this was when I came to town at uh, Rotted Sluice Gate. I'm going to step away now and talk about hydro regulations. Because I, and I want to do this now because you'll see, uh, after I explain this, uh, the challenge that the Holmes and other hydro developers face. Uh, so uh, the, there was a great conference that was held at the, with the renewal of hydro here in, in the 2006-2007 time, um, uh, sponsored by the Agency of Natural Resources. And this included the then Secretary, George Crombie, Laurie Barg of Community Hydro, who's been very active in Vermont trying to uh, reactivate small abandoned hydro sites, the, the river management uh, people, uh, Tom Sullivan of Gomez and, Su Gomez and Sullivan Engineers, one of the two premier firms, Kleinschmidt is the others. Uh, and uh, so it had uh, independent engineers, 
Uh, it had the regulatory people from Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, or FERC, ANR, Dam Safety, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife, State ANR Fish and Wildlife, Historic Preservation. Uh, a new thing at the time is the uh, speed, uh, or independent power producers and speed. This was John Spencer. Remember, he was the guy who uh, tried to uh, get the CVPS project uh, back in 87. And Dave Lamont, uh, who I went to college with at UVM a lot of years ago, who has retired from the Department of Public Service. He's an economist, and uh, I learned from him that electricity is priced in the United States every 15 minutes, and uh, a whole lot of fascinating things about electricity that uh, are the whole part of the other equation for a hydro project is, you know, what can you sell the kilowatt hours for uh, in, in the, the system. Uh, then, wonderfully, there was a, a, a John Warshaw, uh, who was uh, an independent power producer uh, who operates the project in Winooski, uh, and uh, he, he brought in some wonderful props of uh, odd things that had uh, entered his turbines uh, that had come down the river, and uh, some wonderful reality uh, comments. Another, uh, this, this handbook, by the way, uh, uh, is a great uh, compendium, and in it uh, is a, uh, another handbook done by Rob Howland, uh, who is, lives in the area. He lives in Pittsburgh. Uh, this was done in 1980, uh, quite a while ago, but it has all of the issues about water rights, about governmental concerns, the FERC st structure of process, which is first a preliminary permit, then a license, the Vermont Certificate of Public Good, the water quality certificate required by FERC, and how that is uh, that interacts with the state financing and all of these issues, uh, not much has changed from that. Believe it or not, it is, it is all uh, pretty much the same. Um, this is, I don't know if people want to, basic 101 in hydro projects. I think we've been, been there, but fundamentally there is a dam, there is the intake, and it's usually a trash rack and sluice gate. There is a pen stock, there is a turbine, and a generator. There are, uh, are other ways for the water to uh, be exhausted or spillways for this. Uh, out from the generator, or excuse me, from the turbine is a draft tube and the water comes out from that. And uh, a few other important pieces such as the transformer and the switch gear to connect it to the utility. That's that's the, sort of the ugly basic of, of an older power, power project, but Actually, the one at the Twin Bridges in Weybridge Falls doesn't look too different than this. It's got an overhead gantry crane. It's a uh, big, ugly piece of machinery. Um, this was a, a piece done by a uh, fish biologist from ANR uh, about how a dam affects the river. And I put this in because, you know, with the advent of Irene, there was a lot of attention to rivers and river management. This is a huge issue in Vermont. And the part of the Corps of Engineers that still is the dam builders, um, uh, published an article recently about uh, how much flood damage had been avoided in those communities that had huge flood control dams. And so one might ask, well, gee, why shouldn't we be building more dams? Well, that article, of course, horrified the fish biologists and uh, the river, ha river scientists who have been trying to tell people to leave rivers alone, let them uh, uh, migrate uh, their meanders downstream that we would their natural equilibrium tends them to do. Uh, they, are, they are in the process of transporting sediment downstream, and if you put a dam there, the sediment, which contains the spawning habitat for fish, it, it gets interrupted, it collects in here, and the fish say, damn. Uh, a little hydro humor. <laughs> so uh, now, interestingly, when you know I began to educate myself about hydro projects in Middlebury, I said, I asked early on with a CV project, well, well, should they have a fish ladder? You know, uh, and they said, oh no, no, fish don't migrate upstream out here. Then that one's not required. And I'm going, okay, so, well, in bigger rivers, the sediment, you know, is much more fine and, and it carries uh, through in the, in the form of uh, that murky, muddy water, turbid water that you see. But this is in upland streams and smaller sites. Sediment movement is a much more important thing. In East Middlebury, in the Middlebury River, this is a very important. Uh, thing. So uh, people have asked, gee, East Middlebury is, you know, nice gorge, nice river, nice hydro, uh, 
head and uh, why shouldn't we have hydro there? And the river scientists will say, well, once you capture the water to do this, you have to deal with the sediment. And there are other ways to do that. This is a side topic for microhydro of how to uh, not get into the sediment problems that large dams do. So in this uh, 1987, or excuse me, 2007 uh, conference, there was a small engineering hydro. And you know, you can't read this very easily, but all of the issues are what, what, are, you, what are we doing? Are we selling to the grid? Are we off grid? Are we net metering, group metering, managing demand? What are we doing? Uh, what are the resources affected by this? Uh, what sort of environmental issues are there? Uh, how do you uh, address all of the design issues involved? The whole regulatory and construction uh, issues and the operating, the grit, the, the gory details of operating it. The John Warshaw, here's what comes, gets in your turbine, or what happens when the trash rack ices up in the winter, and all these little uh, details that uh, people who operate hydro plants will tell you about. All of these issues are pretty much the same whether it's a small project or a large project. And the larger engineering firms, such as Gomez and Sullivan, um, I want to make sure I'm not advertising for anybody here, but uh, giving due credit. These are their slides from this um, and present better than I could uh, how an, en uh, an engineer for a larger project thinks about these things, but in a much more systematic way. So they look at pre-feasibility, uh, you know, just uh, early on with basic uh, numbers of, of uh, how many head, uh, what's the flow in the river, head is the uh, elevation that you have, uh, flow, and how many kilowatts might you be able to, to generate from that. Uh, and you sort of pr proceeded, proceeded in an iterative fashion through this. Uh, you, you scope it out uh, preliminarily, look at these flow uh, issues, you get a stage discharge curve, and try to figure out in this area you know, are there enough usable kilowatt hours that you can access, recognizing that you have to maintain low flow conditions, there's low flow up here, uh, the ends of the graph, uh, and you can't take the, the flood conditions either, so you, you have to design for the, the right middle part, and that tells you how many kilowatt hours you can generate and whether you can do it. And sometimes the agencies don't want you to generate power at very low flow, as I explained earlier. They proceed through all the constraints, all of the environmental issues, the aesthetics, the habitat, the fish passage, uh, waste assimilation. I, uh, this is another side issue. Uh, the river has a certain amount of dissolved oxygen in it. This supports uh, certain aquatic biota. Um, certain of the other users along uh, the river, such as our town wastewater treatment plant, uh, use uh, oxygen, biochemical oxygen demand, BOD, and uh, the way they look at rivers now is that you're managing a, a, an amount of oxygen for fish. And fish have a pretty narrow tolerance for the right amount of oxygen. Um, and so you have to maintain that for environmental conditions and factor in that in low flow conditions, the water slows down, it heats up, the dissolved oxygen changes. So there's a lot of river science uh, and biology involved in this. Um, there's cost considerations. The, the, the big expensive parts of this, the civil works, the turbine, the generators are, are hugely expensive. You have the regulatory and legal parts of this, which you would think would be simple, but um, they are as, uh, they're less well known, less predictable than turbine costs and things like that. And you're continually analyzing the economics of this uh, to try to make a project work. You have to develop plans. Of course, when you actually get into the application part, the reviewing agencies want final plans right away. They want all the details, and you aren't prepared to shell out all of the money to do the final design until you know you have a green light. So there's this constant tension between the reviewing agencies and the developer. The developer only has conceptual level plans. The reviewing, re reviewing agencies want to know everything before they'll answer anything. And you know, uh, this happens, and it, it is ever so. Uh, but the companies that, that are in the engineering business, of course, want to do this because that's their line of work. And they uh, have a systematic way of doing this and uh, engaging their clients to uh, put uh, fantastic amounts of money up, uh, even as it's uncertain whether they'll ever get approval. And so this is why hydro projects are, are, are uh, struggle so. Well, with that, 
explanation. We'll come back and see how the, the Holmes project has fared. When uh, I was first contacted by Anders Holm in 2006, uh, uh, we worked with them and uh, helped to uh, get basic information about the river uh, from flood studies that we had and uh, uh, engineering information that we had. We shared all that with them. We shared all the information we had about CVPS's uh, proposal and our experience with that. Uh, the experience was pay attention to aesthetics. People want to keep the natural area natural and uh, be darn sure to work out an agreement with the town on this water rights issue uh, soon. So their, pro their proposal, uh, and we developed a, a grant agreement with the Department of Public Service. This is just before the Clean Energy Development Fund. We uh, got some money to help reimburse the homes for their Gomez and Sullivan pre-feasibility study and for this uh, bit of visualization. And so here's the exist a picture of existing conditions. This is the sluice gate washed out, the erosion coming through the, the natural area. Here's the pedestrian bridge. And this illustrates, you have to look carefully, this is a stone-faced uh, underground powerhouse taking the water that comes through the flume and discharging it under the pedestrian bridge. The idea was to have this, you know, you have to really look hard, and that was the point, was to have this blend in, stone so it looks like it matches the character of the area. See, pedestrians have access to the full to the natural area. These, this is the vision that we wanted to try to uh, put forth uh, from everything that we had learned with the town division over the CVPS project. And um, so we went forward with this. Uh, I, I've noted that this was since modified by the homes, and there's a reason for that. Um, uh, even though, I'm going to explain with this map. So here's Main Street, the Battelle Bridge. Here's the Holmes property that they had acquired. Their building's actually here. This is the alley, and the sluice comes through here. They actually own the land under it, even though through history, all of these other entities had water rights through it, as if others had a right of way through through the through there, sort of. This is the Craft Center property. This is the town of Middlebury property that we had acquired from CVPS for a thousand dollars, and was the Jessica Swift Park. So the idea was that the water would flow through here. There'd be a penstock and a new powerhouse under the pedestrian bridge that would be have a terrace over the top. And uh, the idea is that uh, we would. Uh, propose this to the town uh, uh, if uh, an acceptable agreement could be made. This is where planners um, uh, get out beyond their depth. Okay, uh, planners they come up with great ideas, try to get people to agree on things, and then it goes upstairs, and uh, uh, so to speak. So uh, working out the the deal, uh, 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 the town carries with it all of the angst that it had from earlier hydro proposals uh, and the developer carries with it the uncertainty of FERC and all these regulations and um, so anyway this this particular property map it was only meant to illustrate that in this proposal the powerhouse down here which was a great idea of a planner um, uh, in practice meant that there was a lot of civil works a whole lot of pipe and a whole lot of stone terrace work and uh, in pricing this out, the developer found, well, it would be much more cost effective to consolidate this up here. So I learned that they had uh, uh, modified that and condensed it. The town water rights issue was a complex issue. This is from a legal review that we had done. We hired people who knows, knew the most about water rights uh, that uh, we could find, um, and uh, they concluded that uh, these old mill rights that the town actually had uh, over history, uh, acquired uh, most of the latent water rights, as it were, and the, uh, they had measured these in, in old mill times in, in inches of water, and this is square inches, we understand. Anyway, this was a legal analysis, and this, is, I've, this has been made public, so there's no secret to this. The Holmes, for their part, felt that um, the water rights issue uh, should be viewed differently, that the, what... Uh, had existed in historic times was nice for history, but there's another theory in the East of riparian rights, and uh, that's a, a law of reasonable use, and whoever you, you, you know. So anyway, there, there's a legal dispute over this, and uh, the uh, value of this is part of the issue between the town 
And w why the town is interested in this is that in a, in a letter that we wrote in uh, 2009, we uh, had a couple of public meetings at the town offices. I, I'm sorry you can't read this, but this, we, we reviewed the mediation agreement that we had with CVPS. We said we want to proceed and conceptually provide the land and water rights in the same manner. And we really want to do this because we want to be, uh, reach an agreement and be involved with uh, the hydro developers rather than subjected to it through FERC. And the other thing we wanted were some aesthetics issues. And the letter went on to address other things that were irrelevant from the CVPS era. Uh, as I mentioned, the Holmes project uh, moved the powerhouse up to consolidate it, and these were the drawings that we then saw. So these are, these are fairly simple and diagrammatic, but here's the Frog Hollow Craft Center. You can see in dotted lines that this is the turbine discharging the water, and the draft tube comes out. Uh, so that was their concept, was to consolidate it. This is a better uh, artist's rendering done by John McLeod, a local architect. This depicts a spillway, this is a covered... Uh, Sluice way, it's the, the terrace, uh, kind of extending the area that the homes have improved behind their building uh, and connecting to the craft center. And then uh, this, you can't really see the discharge of this, but it would come out in this way. And the trees here are rendered so that you can see this through this, but the idea was to keep as many trees as possible as we understood it. Uh, here's a plan view of that drawing. Again, here's the sluice. This is the uh, covered terrace area. Here's the new powerhouse. And this uh, was only a little bit on town land, but still involved the town's water rights. And, and so this is the discharge area. Uh, uh, this is a, a more detailed drawing of the actual, in, the, in their uh, FERC application. This is the wall of the craft center here. This depicts it discharging a little differently. Um, Anyway, this is a, the turbine and generator and the discharge uh, angles out that way. This is uh, a 2009 letter, which is the Agency of Natural Resources' first sort of comprehensive review of its issues. They had flow issues, fish habitat issues. At the time, they wanted independent studies. And uh, they were also worried about the USGS stream gauge maybe needing to be relocated because even though this was a sort of a run of the river operation, it would affect the head of water, as it were, uh, and would affect the stream gauge and its accuracy of measurement. The stream gauge is behind the Battelle block. And uh, I understand that since then, uh, there has been an agreement reached with, a, with ANR. I, I haven't seen that. And I should explain that I um, was involved uh, uh, or was a recipient of a lot of emails and communications about in the early years of this. And since it has uh, gone upstairs to be negotiated with the select board, town manager, town attorney, and the hydro developers, I uh, do my best to keep up. But I, I've not seen the latest uh, uh, documents on this. However, they are all filed as part of the FERC application. And you can go on your FERC website here, and uh, there's 235 current FERC applications in the Northeast US. And if you can tell it to pick the M's and find Middlebury, you'll see there's two here. And this illustrates there's two parts to this process. There's a preliminary permit and then a license. And the preliminary permit is, uh, the purpose of that is to give a priority of application. Uh, so they ask for initial consultation, but the idea is that it gives, it protects uh, the right of an applicant to have the sort of the exclusive right to, de to develop this. And this is from the Federal Power Act of many years ago, and it's intended to inspire developers to make the investment they need to for all the investigations and studies because they're not going to have someone come along in competition and take it away from them. That's the, the thought behind it. So, you know, the purpose of a preliminary permit is to encourage hydroelectric development by affording its holder priority of application guaranteed first to file status, okay? So um, some people view the filing of a FERC application as a hostile act, particularly if you're also interested in developing. So for any folks in ACORN who thought, hmm, maybe ACORN should develop a project or the town should, uh, should the town be worried about the fact that the Holmes filed uh, for this? Uh, if you, Once you understand the the nature of this system, and uh, it, it should not be viewed as a hostile act. But people uh, 
worried about that, and um, I'm sure there are those who still don't understand it. So a preliminary permit is issued, and they give a limited period of time to, to uh, proceed with this, and the homes also filed a similar application for the other side of the river. Since the uh, water flow and the fish habitat all depends on uh, their project using an appropriate amount of the flow, having another project developed on the north side would uh, be problematic for that. So they, as a defensive uh, move, filed another application called Middlebury Upper East on the other side. And people, are they developing two projects, you know? And so there's, I don't know how much of this is understood, but I try to keep up and it's ch challenging for me. Um, so standard conditions, uh, they need to proceed. It doesn't authorize construction yet, but uh, they need to uh, proceed to, to try to make this happen. Um, there's an order that's issued, uh, describes the basic parts of the project in terms of its capacity and what it's going to do. And meanwhile, for the Upper East site, you know, uh, the idea, oh, excuse me, this is a different letter. Uh, the financial issues of a project, this is just one example, that you know, they were having difficulty with getting state permitting issues at the time this was done, so they didn't have project, but they were uh, uh, you know, keeping, making periodic reports. And so then they filed a license application. They had enough information together, and uh, the license is, uh, is you know, your application to construct, basically. And, this describes it in a little more detail. Again, you can go on the FERC website and see all of this stuff. The uh, proposed design uh, uh, is all there. And for those of you who want to do this, you, you go onto FERC's website, you go to docket search, and you need to have the docket number to find it. And uh, you can click on that and read every document. And there's a lot of them. There's 12 or 14 pages of, of these. Uh, the latest in this is, uh, you know, the Edgewood Holdings, which is the current owner of the Craft Center, commenting and responses by Anders Holm. These are, these are you know, February uh, kinds of uh, filings. And uh, at this stage, uh, um, unfortunately, the, as I tried to describe earlier, that the, the nature of how this has evolved uh, uh, has drawn the parties into um, not communicating well. And this is from my vantage point, and I hope I'm not being disloyal to my employer, but this is like watching a, a couple that you know and love, uh, in this case, a high, you know, people in the town and the town in, in, in a divorce. They're, they've lost trust, they're not communicating, and they're dealing with this in the most expensive, excruciating environment that you could possibly imagine, which is FERC in Washington, D.C. You would hope that they could have come to an agreement. And there's been many attempts to do that. And I understand there was a mediation process last summer and uh, many attempts, and they may be closer to that than is evidenced by their recent filings. But to publicly, what is publicly available indicates uh, some serious communications and uh, problems that persist. So. Could you go back to the docket number in case somebody wants to look that up? I didn't get it on tape. Oh, well. 13. 1323, three. there's two docket numbers actually, but I think this is, the, this is the application for the preliminary permit. And there's a very similar one for the license. When you get into this, you'll see both. Um, uh, and if anybody wants to follow up on this, they can call me and I can provide it. So to keep going, I, I'm gonna spare you the latest exchange. It's just letters back and forth uh, about this. And I'm gonna move to what you really came here for, which is micro hydro. Um, should I stop there? Anybody have questions about the status of the, and the home family, Eric Holm is here and uh, has experienced this from the other side of uh, the applicant's uh, position and, and. I thought your presentation was very fair though, so. Really? Well, I'm, uh, thank you. Sorry, I'll say it again. Fred, I thought your presentation was fair. Um, but if anyone has any questions, comments, please feel free to ask. Um, needless to say, I, uh, the question? town for, in its town plan has uh, asked that, or has indicated that it supports an appropriate hydro project there. Um, there's a lot of details to work out. Um, the interception of all the debris, you know, that stuff that fills up the eddy, 
has to happen off of their property upstream somewhere. Uh, how do they access and construct the project? How are they going to do the excavation that's needed to put the turbine way down under so close to the craft center? These are not insolvable issues, but they're details. And like I said before, the nature of communities and reviewers of this, they want to know the answers to all this stuff. And the developer doesn't know these things yet. They want to know, can we have a project so we can justify investing the money to get the answers? OK, so they're, they're at this point. And um, so I, I hope that it, uh, it can work out. Uh, I think there will still be people in the community who worry that the natural beauty of the falls, the natural flow of the water will be disrupted. Uh, a construction project in the heart of downtown is always disruptive and challenging. Uh, but uh, um, we just did a bridge project, and the town survived it. And uh, I think it's possible. So that's my two cents. Irene. Two comments. Uh, as I recall, in the early 80s, the biggest issue was how much alteration of the falls in general was going to happen. And I think that was probably a bigger objection than anything else. Not that people didn't want the hydro. They were interested in that. But it was going to so drastically change the falls that that was significant. Yeah. And the other, other question I have is, I don't believe, unless I'm understanding not, not correctly, uh, they're not going to be diverting any flow, right? So the therefore, flow is already diverted. It is already available in the sluice. Right. And that, that's my understanding. But then why does it affect the the water flow? Well, okay. Meter. If you open up the sluice. And there was a time when it was it rotted out, and we experienced what happened to the falls for a few years when there wasn't any sluice gate there. There's still a waterfall. Oh, it might be all right. Now, truth to tell, they, they, a hydro engineer will want to excavate the bottom of that flume and get as much water as possible. Because every cubic foot per second of water that they can get and turn a turbine with is money that helps pay for the thing. And smaller projects have to go through all of the expense and studies and difficulty that larger projects do. And this squeezes the economics of a project drastically. So you know, even with uh, feed-in tariffs and subsidies that try to get the price per kilowatt hour to incent small hydro at you know, uh, uh, propping up the economics of this, in the face of uh, contracts with Hydro-Quebec and so forth at a lower price, um, this becomes uh, nerve-wracking for uh, all the people who are involved in trying to finance and make this work. So we don't really know uh, exactly how much will the flume be modified, will it, when it's opened up, will it, uh, nobody wants the falls dried up. And how to, how to assure people in the town that there will be enough water going over, those are detailed questions, and maybe there are some answers of it. Well, to answer that, I can answer that at least somewhat as far as the ANR goes and as far as minimum flows go. Yeah. There is a notion of minimum flow in the, in the falls in total, and you are correct in your first point that this project does not represent the same kind of modification, by the way, that, this, that the current proposal would have. This is an existing diversion, as you pointed out, Fred. There is a minimum level of flow that must be maintained in the falls at all times in order for, the, for ANR to sign off on this project and to not require further studies. That is a discussion that we have had with ANR, and there is a level to which we would obligate and have to maintain in order to maintain operation. So that's a regulated amount. Yeah. It's not something that someone signs off on and that we do whatever we want, or the developer does whatever they want. Right. And this it's is much more scientifically developed than that planner at 1 a.m. in the middle of Rien, 1980. This is, this is, you know, they, this is the, the 7Q10 flow, right, mm -hmm. uh, which is the same standard that Middlebury Lower and Belden's Falls and so forth, all the plant, the older plants are held to. Correct? And most of the information, I think, would be available, should be available in some of the docket information. If not, if people have questions on that, that's a very fair and good question. So I would want to make sure that's provided. So if anyone has any further questions or wants additional schematics, um, please let me know yeah. directly. And I'll make sure you have that information. But no one involved with this project would want to have the same kind of aesthetic or environmental impact that the previous CVPS um, project, which would have been a much larger uh, impact the falls would would possibly want. Does that answer your question? <coughs> Thank you. Yes, Elizabeth. Isn't it kind of ironic that so many, so much has to be discovered and fought over and everything, where and you look back at what was already being, what was there a couple hundred years ago, what was going on when we had mill buildings? <laughs> 
you know, uh, there wasn't a park there, was there? Was there really a park there, and it was it really no, an environment was a you could sit? No, this town. This was a, <laughs> this was a this was not the natural area that you might think, and the river was much more putrid. And uh, there there were other things back in the older days that uh, we romanticized. We don't really know uh, quite uh, how uh, rough it was in early times. I don't think. I don't think we're used to that these days. Uh, you know, just because the government adopts a standard, uh, you know, you might think people will say, oh, we can rely on that. We, we have great confidence in that. Actually, the 7Q10 flow, but there are still people out there who worry about that. And uh, even though, you know, it seems like a good standard, um, uh, developers and communities still will talk about this. So this is just, a, just the nature of our current society, is not to accept at face value anything the government says is okay. I am curious about just one part of your yeah. presentation. You did, um, I found the historical perspective a more than actually I knew. Have you found any precedent in terms of, and this is an honest question, I'm just, yeah. in terms of projects going on today in the state of Vermont, and in terms of water rights, have you found, I know Winooski one didn't, for instance, have you found any that have based negotiations upon water rights? Is there a precedent you can point to and say, oh, this project? Oh, yeah, uh, John Warshaw's project in Winooski, okay. uh, the city of Burlington owned the water rights, and they yeah, make they a payment Yeah, but they didn't do that as part of the negotiation. I mean, as far as Winooski yeah. won, it, it didn't, they, they didn't really discuss it as part of it. And part of our negotiations sort of moved beyond that. So I'm just trying to say, is this something the town is still concerned with now? And what somebody, you know, I can't when I speak walk for the town from, right now. When I walk away from this, I need to, I'm trying to get a sense of, is that something yeah. they want to readdress? I, I, or is that I've, still I've crossed a line here. That, that I. Uh, the town is represented by the town manager, select mm -hmm. board, town attorney. They are deeply involved in this. Uh, my involvement comes from experiencing this with CVPS uh, sure. and the early years when we engaged the attorneys to say, what do we own? You know, the water rights issue is, is a, um, it's sort of like the law of capture. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, uh, what are the water rights worth if you can't use them for anything? I mean, uh, so, but property rights, people pay attention to property rights. And the whole issue has to do with trust and confidence. And, that, you know, uh, wanting to be in, have an agreement mm -hmm. and feel secure with that is why they want to ho hang on to it. Because mm -hmm. it's not like the town's going to use it to, you know, pump water up to the reservoir. We're, we wouldn't actually drink the water out of Otter Creek um, today. So, y you know, it, uh, it's, it's the principle of the thing, uh, and, and it's trust, which is, you know, communication. Remember I talked about the sure. <laughs> parties that couldn't come to agree? Well, that's, it's, that's what it is, I think. Uh, yes? Well, I think it's, it's very simple. Today's a perfect day for this, because what happened with the nuclear plant for the early part, if it's sold, the, the trust that you have maybe in your family now, what happens if it... 15, 20 years down the road, it's sold to CVPS, for instance. Are you talking about our facility? Yeah, some, or, 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 a, or, or a facility, of sure. course. So that's why they want to make sure that it protects no matter who the person is, it's irregardless of mm -hmm. the party they're And that, that was part of the negotiations we had with the town okay. about that, to be honest with you. That's a great point and one yeah. that was discussed. Um, the site's in a trust right now. It, it's irrevocable, so it would be difficult to sell it. So um, that was, I felt, dealt with as part of the negotiation process. That may not be enough of a assurance to the town currently, but we, we did have discussions about well, what would be adequate assurance to the, to the community. We had, actually a little longer than a summer, we had from last winter through the summer um, multiple mediation sessions with the town about this matter. And that, that the, the letters, we sort of skipped this step, the letters are sort of at the end of that when that, that, um, the meeting stopped happening, I guess I'll put it politely. Um, so. In that in that process, there was a six or eight mediated sessions with a with a town mediator, the same mediator who dealt with the bridge project, brought him in to discuss it because that was a fairly contentious issue as well. Sat with the town council, town manager, et cetera, and tried to go through these issues. And that was one that absolutely was discussed. There was no intention to sell the site, um, and certainly if it became a hydro facility, it wouldn't make sense to. So, and you know, we've been in this community a long time. It's not like we're particularly interested in doing that. But your point is valid that from a business perspective, ethics are ethics, but what assurances could we give? We felt we were working toward giving those at the time. So here's the thing. Just in the same way, Vermont is nervous. Vermont really seeks to have control of Vermont Yankee. Doesn't really want to have 
the fate of that decided by some other entity, the Nuclear Regulatory mm -hmm. Commission. We would like to have control in Vermont about that. So, you know, it's not too dissimilar to say, should, how, how confident, are, or confident are we going to be that FERC is going to protect our town interests? We would really like to have local control, local agreement. Mm -hmm. It's the same issue, sure. uh, you know, and s somehow <laughs> get, they, they've tried a number of systems to try to get parties together, but uh, tr trust is one of those issues that y you can't explain. People have to feel it and feel confidence in it. I'll have to check. I mean, we had a draft agreement with the town at one point where they actually proffered the agreement to us. And I think transference may have been in there. I, I'm honestly, I'd have to go back and check the fine print. Yeah. But if, if people are interested in that as a particular issue, I can still answer that. But we'd gotten to the point of a preliminary agreement. So, and that was definitely part of the negotiations. Well, anyway, that's on to, my, on to micro hydro. Stay tuned, folks. Uh, uh, there's been a lot of investment in it, and I think the water will continue to flow and tempt investment. Fred, could you just clarify the concept of the waters of the uh, waters of the state, you know, versus uh, the, the idea of individual water rights? Okay. So in the eastern part of the U.S., just generally, uh, there's a, a riparian doctrine, which is that uh, the public uses and enjoys the waters and is a, a sort of a standard of reasonable use. Uh, you can't uh, take the water and do something with it that's unreasonable. You can't uh, discharge in a way that harms your neighbor downstream. It's basic drainage law and common law that's evolved in this part of the country. In the West, where water is very scarce, there's an appropriation doctrine. And the purchase of water rights is much more common in Western US. But in Vermont, we have this ancient business of mill rights, which are, which are like the appropriation doctrine. And people pay dearly for the right to use the water for their appurtenant to their property for particular purposes. And so, uh, you know, since it's been so many years since, you know, there's been much contest over this, so utilities operate hydro plants, they've amassed these things earlier in history. Um, uh, they, they've been pretty much forgotten, but there is actually quite a bit of case law on it in Vermont in different sites. And so this is why the town uh, hired Paul Gillis, uh, who is uh, uh, one of the most knowledgeable, uh, he's a, quite a student of history actually, uh, and uh, his partner to uh, uh, investigate this. So we had done it earlier with CVPS at our, with our then town attorney, Mark Sperry. Uh, and, uh, the select board back in the 1980s uh, felt the water rights were worth quite a bit, and CVPS negotiated hard to, to uh, acquire those. Uh, so that's why we feel they are still there. If CV you know, felt they were worth something and was prepared to pay for them, aren't they still? Because is the way the select board approached this. Now, lawyers can disagree on, on this, and both parties could spend a, a lot of money on both sides litigating this. It would be much more constructive to come to agreement on it that, because the whole point behind fighting over water rights is having a local assurance that things will be uh, built properly, that the public will have access to it, it will be competently operated and so forth. And that's, that's really what's behind it from my knowledge and perspective. From a historical perspective, Fred, what was the purchase price? Do you remember? I think I remember, but I'm not sure. Of the land? That CVPS paid uh, per year for the use of the water rights for that total project. Um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, drawing a blank, but I could go back. I have the mediation agreement here. Sure. I could look back. They negotiated a price along with a lot of other things that they wanted. And the price was actually beside the point. They, at that point, there wasn't a pedestrian bridge. The early mediation agreement with CV required. CV to build a bridge to the Marble Works, which more later in history cost $200,000. So there's a, there was a lot of things developed in that price that, and if, it's kind of irrelevant. When pe I, people mm -hmm. come to a, a value back in 1980, it doesn't really relate to current value. Uh, current value is what a willing buyer and a willing seller come to terms on. Yep. So to your question, I'm sorry, I don't know your name, but to your question um, earlier, if you want the information regarding the, the legal precedent of water rights in Vermont and so forth. We have done some research as well, and if you need any, any information further, I don't know how interested you really are, but if you want to learn more um, about some of the distinctions and nuances, please let me know. I have to provide that. Thank you. Okay, so the program is Micro Hydro. 
<laughs> well, I'm going to move on to that. And um, so Middlebury, one of our water systems developed by Joseph Battelle in the turn of the century was the Bristol Notch watershed. This was a 600 acre piece of land that the town owned until recently when ANR said we public surface water supplies weren't as clean as wells and because, uh, you know, animals walk around in the woods. And anyway, the, the, the uh, rightly or wrongly, we sold the Bristol Notch watershed some years ago to a Johnson company in exchange for a piece of land where we developed auxiliary wells off Route 116. But that Bristol Notch watershed had a pipeline from Bristol Notch down to uh, angling across Munger Street and angling down to uh, where uh, Halpin Road uh, bre breaks off from Painter Road and coming in town. That water main was built at the turn of the century and it was hand dug by Chinese laborers. Uh, quite a piece of interesting history about it and that pipe is still in existence and it is really thick. It, you know, we have modern pipe that doesn't last as well as some of that. Well, that we have the remnants of it in Middlebury are still part of our water system but it was discontinued from a little bit into New Haven to Route 116 Bristol Notch. But the pipe still exists in Bristol Notch, and it's way up in the mountain, and down below, uh, someone could put in a microhydro project with it. So uh, last fall, uh, this company, uh, Little Green Hydro uh, LLC, uh, called me up and said, we're interested in this, and now we got to talk and we met. Uh, again, I'm not advertising for this company. I just want to tell you we had a brief investigation of this, coincidentally. Uh, so this is their, their brochure. And uh, they, they, this is my idea of connecting to an old uh, abandoned town water system is uh, a much bigger deal than what they're talking about. They were talking about micro hydro uh, and very micro hydro, homeowner type stuff. And their concept was to skim off water, not, not interrupting sediment flow at all, but very small brooks, very small penstocks, and very small powerhouses, and very small turbines, and generating uh, very small amounts of power. Um, so what they were looking for uh, was sites with about 100 feet of elevation differential. Uh, even low flow sites could work. Uh, they were uh, saying that, uh, uh, you know, they felt there was real potential for this. Um, they thought there were thousands of very small sites in the mountains of New England, because New England was mountainous. Uh, they wanted to develop uh, a business model to develop sort of this integrated water-to-wire consulting uh, design-build firm. They recognize some of the challenges, and I don't know how many of these they've actually built. They showed some photographs, but um, if they can make it through the regulatory maze, which is roughly the same for the Hoover Dam as it is for one of these, uh, it, uh, that would be amazing. Um, so there are exemptions. FERC has a, a small exemption, but you know, FERC is a massive agency, and what you actually read the fine print of their exemption, which I tried to do. Uh, it's like they aren't exempting very much. Anyway, that's what I came to learn. This is, this is their handout. I'll show you their, their uh, website. It, uh, their idea is uh, to have something that is very light, very small, um, and can operate uh, as they've illustrated here. And um, there is a FERC guide to small or low impact hydro projects. This is in your handout. Um, I had, had three handouts here I wanted to leave with you. One is this brochure. The other is that uh, how a dam affects the river because of the recent interest with Irene and dams. And the other is a, a four-pager that the Agency of Natural Resources tried to pen in 2007. Uh, it's very interesting to see the Agency of Natural Resources and the state try to explain the process from their vantage point. I think FERC's brochure is cleaner and nicer. It is perhaps too simple and... Uh, uh, Although it's not, but anyway, I'll let you study this. Um, telling for me is that at the end of the ANR memo, the very last thing here, when the que this is sort of in a question and answer format, and they ask the question, how long does this process typically take? And they don't answer the question. They say, well, it involves a number of time frames. Well, this is part of the uncertainty which drives 
uh, which is the most chilling thing, uh, I think, in, in projects, whether they're big or small. So with that, I'm going to stop. And uh, I'm happy to share this information. You, the, uh, uh, if anybody wants to come visit me, I'm happy to do that. Fred, yes, Elizabeth. Fred, um, do you see there, that there may be any changes in the, how difficult it is to push through a project? Is there well, anything that Well, you know, there's the, uh, hope springs eternal. Uh, just, just yesterday uh, in the Senate calendar, uh, I saw S-148. Uh, you know, this is a, a bill, an act related to a pilot project on expediting development of small hydroelectric plants. Um, the State Comprehensive Energy Plan issued in December 2011. Uh, opinions differ on the amount of available hydropower that is available in Vermont. Depending on assumptions used, reports vary from 25 megawatts at 44 sites, estimated by ANR in 2008, to 434 megawatts at 1,291 sites, estimated by the Department of Energy in 2006. A 2007 study for the Department of Public Service identified more than 90 megawatts at 300 of the existing 1,200 dams in Vermont. <coughs> so, you know, this is in legislative findings, and there's potential, but the Agency of Natural Resources really doesn't want to have every one of these developed for hydro because of uh, river management uh, need, reasons, and, and, and uh, they want to be pro alternative power, but uh, that's just what I have heard from my colleagues at the uh, at ANR. Uh, so this, I haven't read, this was on the calendar. I assume this is just a study. I mean, they were going to produce a study and a report by January 2013. The Secretary of Natural Resources shall evaluate options to facilitate the development of micro hydro projects. I, you know, I glossed over in my, I fo focus a lot on FERC, but there is a process in Vermont called uh, the Public Service Board 30 VSA 248. If you sell electricity in the state of Vermont, you need a certificate of public good from the Department of Public Service, excuse me, the Public Service Board. Uh, and they look at a number of environmental issues, uh, not too dissimilar from Act 250 kinds of issues. Um, this is the same process that transmission lines go through, that the Vermont Natural Gas Pipeline will go through. Um, and the Home Project started through this process and, and uh, suspended or withdrew their application at the time. Uh, uh, interestingly, the uh, uh, projects can uh, develop in a number of different ways and not necessarily uh, all fall into that. We know that FERC has federal jurisdiction over this. Uh, uh, does the federal jurisdiction preempt Vermont jurisdiction? Their legal lawyers can disagree over that, particularly in the case of the nuclear power project, but they might also in other cases. And the state argues that the town, the state has economic interests uh, in terms of its investments for uh, and what ratepayers pay for connected to and selling electricity in Vermont. But you can sell electricity in the grid and wheel it out of state too. So um, a number of interesting parallels between the issues of local and state control between hydro and nuclear. Yes, Deb. Um, I think I also heard that, and, and in this ha handout, you know, there's a number of resources, but I think it's, there's a, a <coughs> opportunity to, for communities and regions to look at <coughs> that, you know, whether it's 1,000 sites, whether it's 10 sites, but a community and a region should be assessing that in terms of hydro potential um, and what opportunities there are. So. Um, and, and, and the Agency of Natural Resources, by coming forward to fund the Berry Hydro Project, I think points to at least an agency that might be wanting to partner. And, um, and I, I find that very encouraging and very hopeful. So. Pipelines are easy. I mean, they're, <laughs> you're not uh, affecting fish habitat. I mean, we shouldn't have a uh, fur process in there. You know, I mean, it, uh, <laughs> what, what, um, really. Uh, I, and I want to also put a plug in, uh, Deb, uh, uh, we investigated briefly a, a potential project in Middlebury involving our wastewater treatment plant and the potential for uh, biogas. Uh, and uh, uh, when we, God forbid, do our next upgrade of a plant, we, we may, 
Uh, I'm sure we will look at energy a whole lot more closely uh, uh, than we did a few years ago. We're, we're looking at it with every project, every building project, the fire station. But uh, Deb uh, uh, was able to bring uh, some great talent from UVM. Uh, to, and we investigated that, and so uh, uh, I, I would uh, put a plug in for communities. If this is a, uh, addressed to communities about micro hydro, uh, Deb is one of uh, people in Vermont, people you can go to in Vermont. There are hydro engineers uh, and other companies that are in this, and uh, quite a network out there of people who are interested in helping and uh, have great competence in this. So, uh, thank you. Any other questions? Thank you very much, Fred and Deborah. Okay. I really appreciate it.